right now, I'm not so sure there is much incentive for the user at this very moment in 2021. I'd like to believe that as we head into a future where browsers are making it harder and giving users more control over what data is being captured and sent, that people that want to collect this information need to think about that incentive a little bit more. Welcome to the Technical Marketing Handbook, a podcast all about the things that go beep in the night and the topics that people working in digital marketing should care about. Join us today for a talk about online analytics with a very special guest. Welcome to another episode of the Technical Marketing Handbook. I am your host, as always, Simo Ahava. And I am also the co-founder of Simmer, who is kind enough to sponsor this podcast. Today, our topic is online analytics, which is a loaded term, if there ever was one. In the most general terms, analytics can be translated as the systematic analysis of data. And this can extend from parsing through server logs to see which pages generated the most requests, all the way to complicated data management platforms where cookies are being synced, data is being stitched, identities are being plastered onto graphs, and privacy rights are being infringed upon on a daily basis. It's this complicated mess that makes it difficult in this day and age to define oneself as someone who works in analytics. It seems like it always has to be hedged with something like, but I mean first-party analytics, or but I mean just regular behavioral analysis because the terms analytics and data seem to have become tainted by all the data breaches, privacy regulations, and squirmy ad tech workarounds out there. And it's not even enough these days to talk about Google Analytics, which is by any account the most prolific online analytics tool out there and has a history of being used mainly for behavioral tracking, seeing what people are doing on the site, where they come from, how they convert, and so on. Because GA itself is self-admittedly an integral part of the Google Ads experience. And it's extremely difficult to separate Google Analytics from its ad ecosystem, ad counterpart. So it seems to be that our industry our digital marketing, digital analytics industry has set a standard of data quality that necessarily includes technology that today is considered privacy infringing. The very idea of tracking a user or a session involves breaking through the barriers of the stateless web and utilizing cookies or other device storage to stitch together discrete hits. And this is questionable at best, at least in the European Union, but also elsewhere where privacy regulation and privacy legislation is being drafted. So analytics as a discipline is no longer the sole concern of the analyst, but instead the collective headache of the entire organization as companies are scrambling to figure out not just the data flows that an analytics tool requires and facilitates, but also the clinically obfuscated downstream effects of collecting the data to a third-party vendor. So what's the solution? Well, one course of action is to start moving the technology away from third-party vendors into your own proprietary data pipeline. And one of the strongest contenders in this self-managed data setup space is Snowplow Analytics a modular open sourced analytics pipeline that offers components all the way from collection through enrichment to storage real-time pipelines and even integrations with other tools and services. I'm so fortunate today to be joined by Paul Bucock, who's a or the software engineer at Snowplow, working on pretty much all of the components Snowplow has to offer in one way or another but certainly focusing most on the client-side SDKs and JavaScript libraries that handle the tracking and the data collection on the web and in mobile apps. Paul is a refreshingly honest engineer, ready to tackle the difficult questions about how tricky it is to keep up to pace with customer needs 
all the while keeping an eye on the momentous changes in the web browser space we seem to be going through every couple of months or so, and also being sensitive to the legislation around privacy. So it's not an easy task to tackle when developing a service that essentially should give free reign to its users to mold it into whatever makes sense for their business questions. But the difficult compromise is in engineering features that, so that they don't restrict the use cases of the analytics platform, but so that they don't also facilitate breaking the law or being unethical while going about the business of tracking. We'll talk about the future of online analytics and, and privacy engineering from an analytics vendor's point of view, and we'll get to our interview with Paul after these words from our sponsor. Are you a marketing or a data professional looking to skill up? Take a look at the online courses Simmer has to offer at teamsimmer.com. The courses are completely self-paced and your enrollment will grant you lifetime access to the material, including any updates. Go to teamsimmer.com and use the coupon code HANDBOOK to get 10% off your course purchase. That's teamsimmer.com. Paul Bukok from Snowplow Analytics, could you please explain how tracking beacons work and how an analytics server could use this information? Yep. So we, when it comes to tracking beacons, I think the really we first need to think about uh, what's available in the browser and how we want to send that information from that browser um, to this analytics server and that you mentioned in the question. The, the browser makes available um, a whole host of, of properties and settings that we can read um, in, in JavaScript. And typically, um, most of these um, tracking beacons will read some of those properties, the ones that are most interesting um, from our analytics point of view. And they'll attach that to, to one of two different ways, I think, that we see um, tracking beacons being sent. So we'll read that information that the browser makes available, and then we'll either attach it to an, a request for an image, or we'll send that information um, in what we call a post request, which maybe we can go into in a little bit more detail um, later. Um, the, that data then basically is bundled up in a way that the analytics server understands. And it's sent from the user's browser, um, probably on every page view is a very common way um, to do that. So every time the user loads the page and the tracking beacon fires and it sends that available information in the browser to the analytics server. And there's also some things that the browser send automatically um, that analytics servers find quite useful and things like referrer information on each request, all the cookies that are on each request. And these are the big things that are often hot topics when we think about privacy and, and such from, from some of these tracking beacons. And the analytics server then typically, um, it does probably two things. One, some of the information that arrives is just useful as it is. Um, and we can, we can infer like sort of certain behaviors or a certain um, like the, the user identifiers perhaps that we've got on that request or the page url that's on that request then the other thing it will probably do is it will take some of that and it will combine it to infer um certain behaviors um or certain certain things that like we might re pass out the the marketing parameters for instance that are on the page url to infer what campaign that user is coming from and things like that um, so there's a whole host of information from page information, user information, often session information, um, all the way to, to really simple information, such as the, just the page URL and, and maybe some cookie identifiers and that will be on those, those beacons as well. Thanks. When we talk about beacons, um, I suppose it's, it's like you said, it's typical to have an image request. So the, the, the browser makes a request for an image. And this is the same type of technology we see how uh, you know email marketing is being measured so the emails have these hidden pixels why do you think why, why do you think it's specifically images why why is it not um a, a javascript file or a text file or a, or a form being submitted what's i mean there's a, probably a historical reason for this but what what do you think is the reason why images became the forefront in the element that is being used for this i think partially it's going to be because how easy they are um, to be copy and pasted from a tutorial. So um, it's a one line snippet typically. Um, and you you can give that to really anyone. They work really well in tag managers. You can mm. just make any custom JavaScript and just insert the insert the image directly into your website. So I think from an ease of use 
the, the image beacon definitely um, gained popularity there. Um, and then the other one is is really browsers are very good at loading images. Mm -hmm. um, so by just adding it in an image tag and adding some query string parameters to that image request, um, it, it becomes, yeah, again, really quite quite simple to ensure that that image is always loaded on every page view because a browser will always yeah. load an image when you say, please load this image inside your website. So again, there's, you know, it comes down, I think, to simplicity is why they, they caught on. And maybe the reason they're going out of fashion a little bit, perhaps, um, is because they be it becomes harder to, um, sort of harder to, to extend that, that the, the depth of information that you can that you can track with one, right? You're limited to what you can place in a query string on, on the image. Um, so if you want to do something more deeper, more high quality, perhaps, um, then maybe we need to start thinking a little bit beyond the, the image beacon. But I mean, there's still a great place to start and a significant number of providers still use image beacons as their, their default option when it comes to sending the analytical request. I think that's an interesting thing to state is that it's because it's so easy. I, I think that especially today, and this is probably going to be a topic we're going to revisit many times during this talk is that um, tracking shouldn't be too easy these days. I think I think that's the general notion. I think there's a there's been a huge counter movement against the type of tracking that happens without user input or user agency to control it. And images are probably, for this reason, um, becoming more and more restricted um, due to you no know, content security policies and other things. Do you think? Do you think browsers are, are are consciously moving towards making it more and more difficult to get this information that is sent with those images? So, to you mentioned things like referrer strings, um, which basically tell what the what the referring page was, and this is one of those vectors that browsers are um, trying to get rid of because the referrer can leak information. Is this a trend? What does this make you feel like as a as an analytics engineer building libraries that need to need to gather this stuff? Do you have to be super conscious and, and sensitive to how browsers are evolving? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, things where we can you know, so the the popular way of tracking with an image beacon is to um, add query string parameters onto the end, but query string parameters are a optional concept on a URL. So it's very easy for a browser to just strip those um, and reduce the amount of information that's been sent on each of those. So I think the ease of use of sort of how, how you can implement one also sort of probably means that the browsers can reasonably easily um, maybe combat all that tracking that we're, we're seeing with image beacons. Um, you know, the referrers uh, in most browsers now are removing the query string by default on a, on a referrer, so that information um, has gone and, and similarly on the I know some browsers will block image beacons when they spot them I mean, just before we recorded this we're seeing um, Apple changing the way that their mail clients going to work on um, on iOS um, and they'll be they'll likely be removing um, or limiting the use of an image beacon in, in email so um, we're definitely seeing a shift we um, and it, it is going to make it more challenging I think um, but the good news, I suppose, is that by moving away from an image beacon and into something that is a little bit more complicated, um, the opportunities that you have when it comes to, to the data you collect and the, how rich that data can be, I think there's some doors that potentially open um, as we start moving beyond um, classic image beacons. So one of the more obvious venues which many analytics libraries have and still continue to use is... Um, using a POST request, for example, which just lets you bundle more and more data. Why wouldn't a POST request be the default? What kind of pressures does it set on the collector side of things? Because obviously it's not when you, when you if I, if, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're using an image beacon based setup, you're basically accumulating server logs and those logs are then parsed for the analysis. But with a POST request, you need something more complicated, right? You need an actual API endpoint um, and some programmatic parsing of it. Yeah, so I think, you know, technology has evolved probably significantly since we started collecting um, analytics from websites. Um, you hear stories from back in the day where collecting server logs was, was the way that we all did analytics. But um, he certainly certainly moved on now, and as as servers have become cheaper, you know they're becoming more more commoditized with with cloud providers and 
um, and you know just the ease that you can you can spin up your own your own technology now and um, to run your own apis like you mentioned um i think the the shift will, will definitely be it's, it's easier i think to if you have a system that can infer information from that that full blown post request versus trying to pass this incoming stream of logs and that's really a little bit less structured um you can't do sort of that immediate post processing on that event like you might do if it lands into a, a fully blown server application so if you can find some technology that works for you or you can build your own perhaps and um, it's becoming more maybe we'll touch on, on sort of server side analytics later um but if you can build that api layer and um, to really pass and customize that event as it arrives and um, you can then probably do more with that when it lands downstream in, in whatever downstream tool that you might be using so i think it opens avenues and with the and definitely with how yeah i mentioned earlier how how much more commoditized servers and things are becoming and this is becoming easier to do right it's now super simple super simple i'm probably playing it down a little bit there <laughs> it's pretty simple um to to spin up your own your own server now right there's the serverless things inside these cloud providers that make it really easy um to spin up and run like pre-packaged solutions that give you some of this um, capability in terms of having a, a full-blown api that you can send your analytics events to rather than simply passing server logs um before we dig deeper into what happens in the server, because that's um, whenever we're talking about online analytics, there's people often focus on the implementation side because that's obviously the 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 one the most tangible part of it when it comes to the organization as a whole because everybody wants things that need to be tracked. But before we go there, let's um, quickly visit this idea that when we have browser-based trackers, um, they are essentially you know they're typically JavaScript, but they could be just HTML, HTML as well. But they're typically dynamic code running in the client. And this analytics code rarely does anything functional on the site. It rarely creates or causes anything to happen. It's just a side effect of things that already happen on the site. So when you think about in, in, in these terms that it's really not beneficial to the user directly to allow their data to be collected, like in terms of what they see on the site. And on top of that, when you add the heaps and heaps of data that an analytics vendor could collect, with JavaScript alone, um, they can collect fingerprints, they can collect information that is beyond what the user has consented to. What is the, in, in 2021, what is the incentive for the visitor to allow their behavior to be tracked? Why should they ever agree that, hey, go on, collect my data? What's, what's in it for them? That's a rather uh, hairy question, isn't it? Um, I, Right now, I'm not so sure there is much incentive for the user um, at this very moment in 2021. Um, I'd like to believe that as we head into a future where browsers are making it harder and giving users more control over what data is being captured and sent, um, that people that want to collect this information need to think about that incentive a little bit more. Um, I'm seeing some, some um, clients that we work with now, um, they are they're thinking about we're not just collecting this analytical information for us, but we're collecting it to build a better product. Um, so that might be to give the users better recommendations on their website, right? If I go to a website and it understands me more and therefore recommends things to me that actually improve my experience on that website, that's something that I'm I'm cool with that, right? I don't like being tracked, um, which is um, interesting given I build uh, quite a popular tracking library, but I'm, I'm okay with it if I'm getting something back. And I think that's where we need to switch to. Um, it needs to be a two-way two -way thing. Um, I, someone spots, I was speaking to someone once and they, they said, my data has a, has a value to it. Not really sure what that value is, um, but there is an intrinsic value to me giving away that. Um, so I want something back for that. Um, and I can like to think of it as like a money tree sort of thing almost because that's easy to understand so if my data is worth sort of 50 cents or 50 pence then what can that website give me back um in terms of th that value right if i allow myself to be tracked by them there must be some value to them to tracking me they're getting something out of it their marketing is more effective they're understanding their users more 
and they're selling more to me because their recommendations are better. And that's worth something to them. So I want a little bit of that back, please. And what can they give me back um, that's worth that value? I think that's a, a big question. I'm not sure we've got a good answer to that um, yet, but it's definitely a direction I'd like to see I'd like to see us explore a little bit more um, as an industry um, around that, in, that incentive. Um, however, I think still all, the cookie banners are so prevalent now. People just click accept. Um, so I don't know how many people realistically are blocking mm. these banners that we can't still infer enough information in our sample sizes um, to still make use of it without needing to incentivize further and offer further benefits at the moment. When you're building the snowplow trackers and when you when you or your team is is developing features in those trackers, um, how much these days do you have to think about these th the question of privacy for example are you are you consciously trying to figure out you know different levels of consent for example because until now in or or until recently in many cases consent has been seen as this binary choice between track or do not track and in fact there was a whole do not track signal in the browsers a, a while ago and i think now they're doing something simple, similar with the global privacy control but first of all you know is it possible legal legal advice aside because neither of us as far as i know is a lawyer but do you think it's possible to collect data from a user um without it being in any way identifiable back to an individual so we could maybe not need consent to do that do you think that's a what's your view is there a supercomputer that can identify the user with just a few you know behavioral signals for example even if the data isn't isn't there at all yeah so we have thought about like these levels that you described um we recently introduced a feature called anonymous tracking and there's different levels of anonymous or anonymity um in that um in, in that feature so we've got no user identifiers at all um the there's no session identifiers in there the only real thing that you could stitch multiple events on is the page view identifier so if there's multiple events on a page that's about as as details it gets in terms of stitching multiple events together. But within that, this granularity, we can do just session tracking. That suddenly introduces browser storage, though, to be mm -hmm. able to do that. So then the question of consent becomes you know, probably right. uh, required, I suppose. Um, then on, then the, the top level, I guess, is, is like full user identifying, identifiable tracking. Whether going all the way down to no user identifiers and no session identifiers means you don't need to ask permission. I'm not so sure. Mm. Um, I still think really we need to we need to be asking the users um, whether they want to be tracked. But also it probably depends what you're doing with that data. If you're sending that data off to lots of other third parties to do attribution and things like that, then I think definitely you should be asking for, for consent. I think if maybe you're just using it in a first party context um, to understand how your product is better used and there's no user information in there, then maybe, but I still think it's very gray. Um, and yeah, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not probably willing to offer that advice. I think it is use case specific. Um, and the thing to watch out for is even with no user identifiers, no cookies being stored yeah. in the browser, there's still significant amount of entropy that is, data which is probably quite specific to that particular user on that event that maybe you could still figure out a fingerprint yep. for that user server side and that's where really it's very gray um and yeah what people do with that anonymous event um anonymous in quotes there i think is that's the thing really that makes the difference as to whether it it can be cookieless or or consentless tracking so i think our our consensus here is that it's better always to err on the side of things that um, getting consent is a good idea always, regardless of what the current status of the law is. And I, th I think this is forward thinking as well, because we don't know um, what EU legislation, for example, is going to evolve towards. We don't know what the US legislation, we don't know what UK is going to do, um, but we can assume that things are only going to get stricter. There's, there's no reason for them to start taking out things that are currently in the regulations, maybe modifying them, yes, but not, you know, EU isn't suddenly going to um, say that, hey, 
okay, you know, we used to say that all personal data is evil and or, or we don't collect any personal data without legal basis, but they're not going to suddenly say that, okay, IP addresses are fine now after all. We gave it some more thought and they're fine after all. So keep collecting them for analytics purposes. So that's the, the I think that's the push and pull that we have in this industry. We have to kind of figure out, and this is a cliche, but we have to figure out how to get the best data without infringing on the user's privacy. And everybody says this, but nobody actually ends up doing it. So I'm just like really curious from an engineering point of view, how do you engineer privacy into a system? Like, for example, you mentioned the word anonymous, which um, sounds like a fairly self-evident thing, but but it has such a, there's so many, so much complexity, not just in a technical point of view, but also from a legal point of view, what is legally anonymous when we look at the GDPR text, for example. So it's just, uh, I'm, I'm wondering like how much when you're designing features, um, do you think that privacy has entered your mindset and your team's mindset when you're developing these features more over the last years or has it always been present? Um, of course, hindsight 2020, but what do, you, what do you think? Is it is it more prevalent these days? Yes, I think so. Um when we're designing the default. And so I think I should step back a little bit. The Snowplow tracker that I work on is incredibly flexible. Mm. It offers a huge amount of options in terms of how you track um, on your website. So with that in mind, the real, like you can definitely collect a lot of user information, a lot of things that, you know, the IP addresses, user identifiers, like study cookies, local storage, session identifiers, um, all the referrer information that we've earlier discussed, all of that can be collected. Um, but because of this customization that it offers, you can also not collect a lot of that information. So the shift that we've made, I think, is by having like sensible defaults, trying to work out what are good defaults that both are useful for the clients of Snowplow, the people that are using the Snowplow trackers, but that still have a, a more privacy-focused sort of default. So a, a reasonably recent feature um, was the new client hints yep. um, change that, that Chrome's bringing in when they freeze the user agent string. Um, there's two levels of client hints that you can read in JavaScript. There's sort of the, the base one, and then something that's called high entropy um, client hints. These are client hints that can be more easily used to fingerprint users. So for instance, we implemented client hints as something you could capture. Um, but by default, it just captures those base two, which is like browser and the version of the browser, just to give you some information of what browsers your users are on. Uh, if you want to, you can ask for the high entropy values. So that's another level up, which is definitely more, let's call it privacy infringing. There's more entropy in there. It's more fingerprintable um, downstream. So um, that's, the, that's sort of what we're playing with here. There's often multiple levels of what we can have. And it's about having these good defaults that, that are still useful for users who are capturing this data and wanting to perform analytics on it. But also we're still we're starting to inform those those users about like this is a more privacy oriented default. Maybe you should think about this being the right way to capture data. It's a, there's a big education piece here around what can I do and what can I can what can't I do if I do or don't collect this piece of information. And I think that's the big thing. Historically, we've been, let's capture as much as we can, mm. because then we'll be able to infer more useful information from this wider set of data. But now that comes with risk. We've got GDPR, we've got changes in legislation potentially in the future. We've got countries that have got different sets of rules depending on you know where the user is. So capturing everything now is definitely more risky. So having these different levels and different options um, available when it comes to how you track your users, I think is you know, it's definitely important and it's becoming more and more important and you understand as well what, what happens when you change from this default value to this other default value. Um, yeah, so I think, and I do think we need more education around this stuff, right? Maybe, maybe today is a little bit of that. I, I think one of, the, one of the things the browsers have been, I mean, this is a discussion that browser engineers are having as well over the last years. And I think one of the things the browsers decided early on in this, um, you know, post ITP world is that browsers are the user agent and they represent the user and they want to do right by the user. And so browsers have started introducing features that simply prevent things. They don't even default anymore. They just prevent, period. And um, 
I'm wondering, do you, do you see ever an analytics platform? Because analytics seems to be at the eye of the storm when it comes to these privacy discussions. Do you ever think that it's Snowplow's responsibility to do the same thing, to actually, instead of just providing defaults, but also to just kind of prevent certain capabilities that are, in the majority of your research, proven to be harmful? Fingerprinting is one thing, um, you know, collecting super granular high entropy information is another uh, when you can easily do with a lower level of entropy and 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 kind of as a follow-up to that um do you think it's your responsibility or should you just delegate it to the browser and and before i let you answer the reason i'm asking this is that i can easily see a situation where even if you have set something as a default and one of your customers or someone who's forked the snowplow library does an implementation and does removes those defaults and does some horrible nasty stuff gets caught red-handed and then the analysis or the or the big you know tech crunch article says that by the way it was a snowplow tracker running on the page which is obviously a huge brand damage for you guys do you think that and is that something that plays into the equation as well we have privacy on one hand then we have your brand and your reputation on the other and then we have the fact that you need to provide flexibility for different use cases how do these three come together when you're develop this is not an easy question i'm sorry but how do these th- how do these things come together when you're developing features yeah um so when it comes to preventing um we did remove client side fingerprinting um i think last year i think we dropped it entirely um and i think we dropped it for two reasons one client side fingerprinting is definitely the most privacy inversive thing there's rarely any permission that's asked when someone does do client side fingerprinting and the other one is it it wasn't like a great implementation, let's be honest. I think in our tracker, um, it didn't really um it wasn't it didn't have enough high enough entropy, I suppose, um to really um spot one user from from the other. Um, and it was very susceptible to like subtle browser changes like changing monitors or changing the size of your browser window and things like that, um, where you could easily get a new fingerprint, because that's often a fingerprinting vector, like monitor mm-hmm. size. Um, so, so we removed it, um, and we were, I, I, as an engineer was incredibly happy to like be able to remove that feature. Um, and it's something, I think there's, there's often like a, is that there is a definite like pull, push and pull thing, like the engineers are often more privacy oriented and the customers that are extracting value from this data that's being collected, they're more likely, I think, to operate in the gray area, certainly not all of them. Um, but when there's you know money to be made through more effective advertising campaigns, if you can collect a little bit higher entropy information, then I think you generally would. Um, and that's, I think, where that education piece comes in. Um, when it comes to preventing people entirely from doing anything that we, I don't know, let's call it nefarious, for lack of a better word, um, the, it's hard for us to do. I mean... If a user really wants to collect something that is very privacy infringing or they run the tracker without asking for consent, there's not too much we can do here. And I think part of it is because there's no there's no real framework for this yet. The browsers are all running off in different directions and they're all doing it slightly differently from one another. And there's no real consensus at the moment in terms of when has a user asked for permission or oh, given permission, sorry, um, for their data to be collected, uh, when have they not? And the, I think really the only place that that can be prevented is at the browser level. Now we have a we do have a duty at, at Snowplow to ensure that we're educating, and that we're making our software as privacy so friendly as possible. Um, I think that's a, a really important play for us, um, and it's definitely something that is always in my mind when it comes to um, what we're implementing and how we're implementing it. Um, and we've had the IDFA changes on iOS and we had to do some work there to make sure that we were, um, that what Apple were doing, we, we were well in line with that. Um, and that, you know, again, that was a good change for our tracking libraries to be able to offer that, you know, that, that extra opportunity for privacy for the user. Um, similarly on the web removed from fingerprinting that I already mentioned. Um, but but we do get pressure in the other direction. And I think that's the 
that's the challenge that I think we face in the middle a little bit. Where, um, so I think it comes down to education and and being clear about what our beliefs are, what our ethical standpoint is as a business. These are the important things that we try and try and make make come across very clear. And we don't want to work with certain organisations. We'll tell people that they're very openly. We'll tell people they're doing this wrong, incorrect, in a privacy infringing way. And we're very open and happy to have that conversation with both clients and open source users. Um, and it's about having that conviction, I think, there, um, from our point of view. Um, but I do think it is, I think the ultimate like, decision has to lie with the browsers because they're the ones that have the control to, to really make, make a difference in terms of what's allowed and whether we've got consent and things like that. Would you ever see Snowplow or, or again in feature engineering trying to figure out workarounds to what browsers are doing to give clients like the freedom of choice again. So when browsers are are um, removing access to storage, for example, this is obviously seen as a, as a huge detriment to first party analytics as well. And not many necessarily, especially in our field, not many agree with these things because they see that first party should be a negotiation between the company and the visitor and the browser shouldn't really have that kind of impact there. Or at least first party gives so much more agency for the site to engineer analytics in a way that doesn't infringe on privacy. And yet we are seeing first party being eroded as well with things like cookies being expired sooner and and CNAME redirects being being truncated as well. Um, what's, you know, does Snowplow have to figure out workarounds just to keep the status quo for your big clients, for example, from a commercial point of view? Yeah, so there's definitely, I think by being a purely first party tool, um, Snowplow runs in an organization's own infrastructure. Whether you're a client of the paid product or you're using it as an open source product, it's running in your own infrastructure. And I think that's a little bit different. There's no there's no third party involved at all in terms of like who's processing the data. Um, it's all being sent into a, an account that is not Snowplow's account, ultimately on AWS or in, in Google Cloud. I think... That, however, doesn't mean that we can suddenly start working around all of the efforts the browser manufacturers uh, are, are doing in terms of protecting people's privacy. But there are pieces of education we can do to ensure that a Snowplow pipeline is or has the best chance of collecting as high a quality data as possible, whether that be running it on a first party domain so that the collector is running on the same domain as the primary website whether that's customizing the path that we send our post requests to um, to ensure that ad blockers don't always block snowplow tracking. These are pieces of education that we do to, to ensure that that data is being collected. Um, but and I think they, they potentially would be seen as workarounds, but we're not doing them from a, a privacy avoidance point of view. We're still trying to educate people to ensure that there are cookie banners in place and you're not tracking with Snowplow before a user's consented. These are still important pieces. Um, but we do feel that some of the ad blockers are blocking everything that they possibly can now. It's not just about blocking ads anymore. It's about blocking all tracking. Um, and I don't necessarily think that's fair if you're doing first party product analytics that an ad blocker comes along and potentially prevents you from collecting that, that valuable behavioral information about how somebody's using your product that could make your product better. If that's genuinely what you're doing, it doesn't seem fair that an ad blocker blocks that. I think if there was a privacy focused um, sort of tool and it was all about like making sure that my data is not being collected and less about blocking ads, then maybe I'd be, and I think some of the ad blockers are moving in that direction, right? I think that's a little bit fairer. Um, so there are some workarounds. I'm never going to allow us to implement a, a workaround that was, you know, if we don't have access to cookies, we start fingerprinting. I think these things need to go away. Um, I don't think that's fair on anybody, and particularly the end user. But there are certainly going to be certain things we can do to ensure that, you know, your pipeline has the best chance for that event that you want to track to land in your data warehouse, for instance. Um, by we switched, we had some users that were still using C names. We switched them to A records when that change came along. 
I mean, it didn't really make any difference, but it prevented the CNAME um, blocking that was that was starting to appear in Safari from impacting the ability for users to collect information and for our clients to collect information about their users' behavior. So yes, we'll make changes as browsers and the, the online analytics evolves, but we'll only make changes where we feel that, you know, it's fair on everybody involved. Um, and I don't think I'll ever, I'll certainly never be a proponent for, for building a workaround that does, does feel like it infringes on somebody's privacy. I suppose it's super. I, su I suppose it's really, really tricky to understand the user's intent on why they are blocking. For example, we d we don't know why they are using an ad blocker. We don't, or a privacy blocker, or a content blocker, whatever you want to call them. And you know, if if let's be honest, if if you were to design an ad blocker, or a content blocker today, you would probably block more. You would probably block. Try not to even figure out what the user's intent is. Not add that kind of granularity there, but just block. Same thing, you would block GTM or Google Tag Manager simply because most of the use cases would use it for advertising and analytics, even if there are legitimate use cases that have nothing to do with data collection. And similarly, you might want to block um, Snowplow, even if even if in most cases it's used as first-party, um, constant-only, privacy-friendly way, you still have those who don't. And, and it's from an engineering point of view, again, an, an ad blocker that is already an optional install, that's an opt-in for the user in most browsers, um, it would make sense to just keep blocking. But I do understand the frustration and I would imagine that, um, again, this is probably not Snowplow's problem to solve because Snowplow's tracker is running on the first party domain and the first party domain is the one that's being blocked by these ad blockers. So the, you know, if, if um, a large enough site notices that, that they're not able to collect data and, and, and the blocking isn't done fairly, they can obviously raise this in the ad blockers discussion forums because most of those are open sourced but it's tricky yeah i think one of the things to think about here is whether it matters if a lot of your users are running ad blockers or not i think typically you probably find maybe 10 to 30 percent of your users are likely running ad blockers um if that still leaves you with a big enough sample size to do what you need to do then does it really matter that that many people are running ad blockers? Uh, and I think that's a question that organizations should ask themselves when trying to think about workarounds and trying to think, like, spending all this time and effort in terms of like working around these privacy features of browsers. If you're still collecting enough useful information across a variety of platforms, it probably doesn't really matter too much. Let your users run the ad blockers they want to run. Let them sort of keep keep their browsing more private if they wish to, you're still going to collect a decent amount of information from, from the rest of your user base. Um, so maybe, yeah, maybe we do spend a little bit too much time thinking and worrying about these privacy focus changes. I think the bigger ones where an entire, a, you know, a huge percentage of your users use a particular browser and that browser brings a change in that has a huge impact, then yes, worrying about those is important. Um, but I think worrying about people that are installing optional ad blocking technology into their browser, maybe we don't need to worry about those as quite as much as maybe we do sometimes. Right. I think before we, we wrap things up, there's one more venue I want to explore with you. And we've been talking about browser-based analytics um, simply because that's that's typically the, the majority use case. But there is obviously an app component to analytics as well, uh, which over the last... Um, iOS updates especially has become a very central point of this discussion. But uh, I, I, I'm interested more in, in, again, from an engineering point of view, what extent are the principles that you apply when designing a browser-based tracker like the Snowplow JavaScript library? Um, how relevant are these principles when you're designing a tracking SDK for mobile apps? I think they're pretty similar. Um, there's a huge amount of crossover particularly in terms of how the data gets sent and collected. So much like the browser makes certain pieces of information available um, for um, to collect, the mobile SDKs that are available on Android and iOS, they also make a certain selection of information available um, to, um, to be collected. The big difference, I think, around the two at the moment is that the mobile platforms, because they're typically a little bit more closed, and is less open, perhaps, in the internet. Um, 
there's a lot more permissions based features available for end users. So I'm sure we've all had an application ask us for permission to access our location, um, something along those lines. There's a lot of there's a lot of granularity now in some of those permissions that you can ask or be asked for as an end user. Um, and this this gives more control to the end user about what data is collected. Um, so we need to be aware of that um, when building the library, the SDKs for doing the tracking. These we the the APIs that we use in the SDKs to talk to the, the operating system and um, of the mobile platform, it will there'll always be this opportunity for us to get denied access um, to that piece of information. So we've got to be able to handle that. And we've got to make sure that we go in a particular path. Um, so yes, we get access to location information. Okay, we can track that if the users give permission, or we've been denied access to that, therefore that information is not attached to the event. We're a lot more aware of that um, right from the start on building the mobile SDKs. And I think that's part of the change that's happening over in, in the browser world now. Fe more and more features are becoming asked permission. Location's already become that in the browser. That client hints one I mentioned, the idea of being able to get high entropy data, it's been designed in a way where the user has the option um, to permit that or not. Although no browser yet asks, um, I think it's been designed with that in mind. So I think that's a shift that we'll see in the web, um, but that's already there in mobile. Beyond that, they're pretty similar. Um, where you've got a page view, we typically think we've got a screen view, and we can still do session and user tracking. Um, arguably, user tracking is easier because a one person has one phone usually, um, and the installation of the application is usually long, quite long running. People rarely reinstall the applications um, that they have on their phone. So the idea of a user ID is typically um, very easy to tie to the lifetime of an application install. Um, so there's things like that. They're very easy to do on mobile. They're a little bit trickier um, in browsers. Um, and there's also been a lot more education on browsers around like clearing your cookies more frequently or having settings in the browser to clear your cookies every time you, you quit your browser or reboot your computer. Um, that mean those user IDs reset more frequently than typically we would see on a on a mobile platform. Um, so there's some benefits to mobile tracking and there's some cons to mobile tracking. Um, but on the whole, they're, they're reasonably similar in terms of how uh, how you want to track your users and how you want to collect the data on your users in those platforms. I suppose it gets tricky as well with the, the additional overhead um, um, because you now have to think about device battery as well on a computer when you're browsing you're you're, you're probably locked in or you're probably plugged in but on a mobile device um, especially network requests and and they eat up your data plan they eat up your bandwidth which i suppose is the reason why many um, many sdks automatically for example prevent data from being sent when the app is backgrounded um, so it's it's just uh, from an engineering point of view again an interesting approach. But from a from the collector's point of view, when the snowplow collector is running in the cloud and parsing those incoming requests, is would that be? It it probably doesn't have to change uh, when the incoming hits are coming from a mobile device versus when it's coming from a desktop browser. No, we have a common protocol that the collector understands, and we both the web and the mobile they both send data in that common protocol. Um, However, there is definitely certain very like properties in that protocol that are more web oriented because that's what it was designed for. Page URL doesn't make um, a huge amount of sense on a mobile platform, um, typically, unless you're in like a, a web view, um, like it does on the on the web, right? So that's something where there'll be probably less properties on the mobile platform in the in the core. We call it the canonical event, the base event. Um, but there's a lot more contextual information that you can add to event and um, to an event on mobile. Things like battery life is a great example. Um, something we're actually investigating now, um, like adding that battery information is contextual information um, to every event, so that you understand the battery drain that your application causes. Right? I think that's a really interesting piece of product analytics that you might want to want to look into when it comes to your application. Um, so, yeah, same event type. Same um, event structure, but your different parts are, are certainly populated when it comes to web versus versus mobile. And I suppose this is again one of the reasons why having a flexible analytics platform where you can impact every part of the of the kind of the journey of the data bit from the from the tracker all the way to reports is 
comes useful because you can choose the semantic content of your app, web web hits and your app hits, and you can choose whether or not you know a page view makes sense in mobile as well, or you can choose whether or not a session should be the same between a mobile app and so that's the, yep. the and the, and I I suppose for many people who who fall in love with Snowplow, it certainly was for me is the fact that you can. Um, you can decide what you want the platform to be, or you can just stick with the pre-built schemas, which are obviously very valuable as well. And there's even a, there's even a schema for Google Analytics for people who need like the uh, familiarity that comes from Google's kind of um, hegemony in this in this field, where they've been able to dictate what online analytics looks like. But um, I, I think this this actually um, might might be a great way to wrap things up. Is that well, I have a, I have a little thought experiment for you. Um, so if, if you if you now I give you godlike powers, you're welcome. And if you could you. if you could cha- change any aspect of the web, interpret this question however you like, first of all. If you could change any aspect of the web at the snap of your fingers with regard to your work um, in online analytics, uh, what would you do and why? I actually think this is um, a little bit easier for me. I would immediately find a way to remove all of the cookie banners. <laughs> um, they've become so prolific um, that we just we almost don't see them anymore. I feel like my mouse and my hand immediately know where to go to just accept and get beyond it. Um, what I would like to see in their place, however, I don't think we could just remove them. Um, I'd like to see a common framework for permission and that I am allowing all websites um, to be able to um, adhere to. So I want to set at my browser level um, I am willing to part with this information about me. I'm allow, I would like to allow or ask websites to only store these pieces of information. Um, and maybe there's, it, we could get really granular about this um, in terms of like how they're using it. And we saw this a little bit with cookies around like functional cookies versus advertising cookies and things. I think there's some opportunity for some use case based concepts around what I'm willing to let a, a website do. Um, but it, it can't get too complicated. I think we have to remember who the end user is around this. But I'd love to see a cross-browser effort with a common API across all browsers that I can subscribe to and understand exactly what the end user is happy for me to collect with the tracker and send to that into that Snowplow pipeline. That would be my ideal future browser feature. So I think this sounds like a, an evolution of do not track in a way that you, you you do have a browser setting, but obviously do not track was maybe a little um, too generic and too um, and and it, and it gave too many outs for site to ignore it. You, you you didn't have to respect it. It was it was a browser um, a field that you could read and then. I almost working. wish it was the other way around, so that it was do track this rather than yeah. do not track everything. Um, and right. yeah, maybe everything's ticked by default, right? So we do, but then the users can say, I don't want to, in this use case, I don't want this information to be tracked about me. I never want to be a, my location to be tracked. But I am quite happy for you to track a user identifier for this particular use case or something along those lines, or in this particular style of tracking or something like that, rather than a, it was too blanket before, it was in or out. Yep. Um, and it was also very easy to not respect it um, as a when collecting. So. Um, I think that's probably why it didn't really take off. I mean, there wasn't really much use in an end user um, ticking or unticking that box because a lot of websites just ignored it anyway. So I think it needs to be done at the API level in JavaScript so that we can or cannot read certain pieces of information. Um, and I think there also needs to be a, a service that I, as, a, as an engineer building a tracker, can ask the browser, well, would this user prefer me to track or not to track? I and mean, then I can... If I'm a privacy focused tool, um, I can I can listen to that and and I think that would become very popular then. Companies would want to run that hopefully on their website. They would want to run it in a way where they were doing as a user wants. And then maybe we could tie it back to that that early discussion we had around the incentive. Uh, if a website can make it clear, if I tick this box, this is what you're going to get from my website if you're allowing this information to be tracked, um, then you're going to get better recommendations, you're going to get a better experience. And it's all about building that system. There's a there's a value for everybody in sharing data, um, but it's about doing it in a way that everybody's happy with. And yeah, that'd be my 
very idealistic future states um, that we end up in. Well, if the if the snapping fingers didn't work, let's hope that somebody out there is listening who who can actually make these decisions. I think that sounds like a like an interesting use case, and and certainly uh, might be related to. Um, some of the work that's being done with things like the global privacy control and maybe even do not tracks future evolution, but that does sound like um, like a, a good compromise between uh, moving things to opt in, but still having um, a way to globally say something without sacrificing that uh, granularity of purpose. That I just for want example, rid of all the cookie banners. Yeah, that's that's, my... I think we all do. I think we all do. <laughs> I, know, there, I think there are some even some like browser extensions that yeah automatically click yes to. Um, all of those, but yeah, that's a that's a that's a beautiful future for me, in my view as well, from a user experience point of view. All right, Paul, thank you. It's been a it's been a great talk with you. Very interesting stuff. Um, obviously, we slipped into 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 the privacy territory a lot because this is uh, a, a very topical thing, as it should be, and as as it's been for years now. But it's always interesting to hear an engineering perspective too. To these things and you've been doing a lot of valuable work with snowplow and snowplow for anybody uninitiated is certainly a platform to take a look at um, especially today when the when the big ones are having all sorts of turbulence in their ranks and and enterprises might be looking for for something different as well this is not an endorsement this is a a, a fan of snowplow um, saying these things thank you so much for coming on the podcast paul no worries it's been great to be here thank you very much for having me Thank you again, Paul Bukok, for that interview. If you made it this far, it means there's probably something wrong with you, but I am, of course, very grateful for your audience. Just remember to subscribe so you won't miss any of the episodes when they come out, and we'll be back in two weeks' time with the next episode. Until then, take care and stay safe. <music>